so we could it's it's okay. just about five after so we could go ahead and probably get started we have nine people right now yeah we can start it thank you very much uh, i'm pleased to talk to you about where our studies of the influence of the microbiota on the brain have been going in order to make this comprehensive and clear i need to review the background both of the field and of, of my work in this area. And when I say neurodegeneration, I mean Alzheimer, Parkinson's, and ALS. And when I say microbiota, I mean all the uh, bacteria, fungi, and viruses that um, are in and on our bodies. And when I say the gut, I mean the entire gut, starting in the nose and mouth, uh, going all the way down. It's not only the colon. And I will talk about uh, various aspects of this. And I'm pleased to acknowledge my thanks to my collaborators, Levi Beverly, Ramesh Gupta, and Harry Bodolori in microbiology, anatomy, and medicine, and, and others in Japan and the United Kingdom. We're grateful for our support from these foundations, agencies, and institutes, particularly recent, recently, to my great surprise, uh, there's funding from the US Department of Defense for this work. And I have previously talked about my first book, which is about the four factors that impact how you age. This book has a comprehensive discussion of what everybody can do to enhance the interactions of the microbiota with the brain and why this is important for aging. But I will talk here today about how the microbiota are involved in the brain, but I won't have really time to discuss what everybody can do to enhance these interactions themselves through gene therapy in the kitchen, which means uh, through their diet. I also need to discuss what is my second book, which is um, Nearing Completion, 120 Lessons in Critical Thinking for Young Doctors. For Young Doctors means medical students, residents, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, dental students, and so on. And the idea is, I believe, uh, it's very important to be aware of how we think and not allow it to be uh, done so-called so on autopilot. Because if you think about science and about our patients, uh, it's in, important to notice how we make judgments, how we perceive, what are we paying attention to? So several times in the process of this talk, I will mention conceptual items, which I think are uh, reflective of how we think and both errors and positive aspects of thinking. To start with the negative aspect, perhaps, is just to be uh, up to date. I think it's important for everybody to know about these new Alzheimer's antibodies. There's aducanumab and lecanemab. There's also donanumab, but that the data on donanumab are not yet completely published. And these two agents have been uh, approved by the FDA or are about to be approved. And uh, I will not support their use, not myself. I won't be prescribing either of them. The reasons are shown here that there are seven problems with this. They are monoclonal antibodies targeting the amyloid protein. And actually, this protein is not linked to cognitive impairment. I believe it's the wrong target. And the benefit for lecanemab is only 27%, which is about two points on an, on an Alzheimer's disease assessment scale score of 70 points. And would you really pay $26,000 to go up two points on a 70-point scale? 
the risk of bleeding and swelling in the brain is significant with both of these antibodies. The cost, the cost is very high. Uh, lecanemab made atrophy worse, and that's not a good thing. I believe more significantly, the double blinding may not have worked because subjects could guess which group they're in based on their side effects. But most notably, in regard to my interest in thinking and conceptualization, the FDA principal deputy commissioner a few years ago in approving aducanumab, despite the fact that the advisory board of 10 distinguished neurologists and pharmacologists had advised against it, she said, we have to stop thinking empirical evaluation is the only way of evaluating truth. What she was approving the drug based on its effect on the biomarkers, not on its effect on the patient. I think this is really very dangerous. And uh, just to be sure I knew what I was thinking here, I looked up the word empirical, and empirical means evidence. And she's saying, oh, we should stop thinking about evidence. And what is, what is going on? How could she get to be commissioner of FDA if she thinks we don't need evidence? I thought we, finished, we, we were finished with this argument with Aristotle. But for the rest of our going beyond the, these new drugs, and I will be glad to have your questions later, either during the meeting, of course, or later by email. I propose that Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, they're all initiated by interactions. These interactions involve prion-like misfolding and inflammation. And the key factor is Uh, it's relatively easy to influence the microbial populations inside our body through diet, supplements like polyphenols, antioxidants, fiber, and probiotics, and fecal microbiota transplant, or FMT. And there will be drugs, and are drugs in development, agents in development, which will affect the brain effects on the microbiota. My key question here is, why do people get these diseases? <clears throat> and again, here in my interest in conceptualization and critical thinking, this is a question which we, has not been answered. So the amyloid cascade hypothesis does not explain how patients get the disease. For Alzheimer, we must remember 99% are not caused by genes. The answer to this question, why do they get it, is that we don't know. So if someone has an E4, two E4 alleles, they have a high risk, maybe elevated 10 to 12 times compared to others. However, at age 80, about 40% of them don't have it, if they live that long, of course. I think this shows that it's not the cause of the disease, even in someone who has two copies of this gene. There must be something else. The amyloid cascade hypothesis of John Hardy, Dennis Selko, and Rudy Tanzi explains what happens in the 1% who have a causative gene, which affects amyloid beta protein, but not in the 99%, which are the vast majority of cases. In addressing this question, Stanley Prusner, who had the Nobel Prize in 1997 for the prion concept, he proposed that the initiation is random. It's stochastic. I don't think this is a suitable or ex acceptable explanation and does not consider the environmental factors. Also, what is causing the inflammation, which appears to be key in these diseases? Uh, they haven't explained it. So again, in regard to my interest in thinking, if you look for an analogy 
what similar similar process could be going on in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so on. We know that in BSE, a pathogenic agent in food comes from coming from cows in this case, or from scrapie in sheep, enters the brain through the gut, through the autonomic nervous system, after it is consumed in, as food. So we know this is established, a very, very well-documented precedent that an amyloidogenic agent in the gut can affect the brain and cause BSC, which is essentially uh, Kurzfeld-Jakob disease. So in the early 2000s, I thought, considering this, what else could be going on from the gut that affects the brain? And it had been shown in 2002 by Chapman in Michigan that bacteria make extracellular amyloid proteins. And if you have been looking at amyloid beta protein in the lab or in the literature, of course, you'll look at this E. coli in the photo, these amyloid fibers it's producing look exactly like amyloid beta protein. And the extracellular amyloid fibrils here are beneficial functional proteins, and they're made by all these bacteria shown on the left. And this is an incomplete list, but these are all bacteria that we have. There's no doubt that we're all exposed to many of these bacteria, particularly strep mutans, which everyone has in their mouth. So I made these two proposals in 2015. It was very hard to get this paper published. I proposed, first of all, that these amyloid proteins cause cross-seeding and that it was transmitted to the brain and that the response to this protein involved toll-like receptor 2, CD14, NF-kappa-B, and INOS, nitric oxide defense which is the same pathway as the brain uses to recognize amyloid beta protein. I didn't predict this, but it was subsequently shown that this interaction takes place. So that exposure in the gut would cause priming of the immune system in the brain. And that's what we showed in this 2016 paper, together with my collaborators here and in Cleveland. So exposure to this protein in the gut caused alpha-synuclein aggregation in the brain and also microgliosis in the brain. So here is a something happening with bacteria in the gut, which is affecting what's happening in the brain in, a, in <clears throat> aged rats, which is a model for Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> Subsequently, Masmanian and colleagues in, at Caltech showed that the, this curly protein influences aggregation of alpha-synuclein and that if you inhibit the curly production of amyloid by EGCG, which is a polyphenol found in green tea, this uh, interaction is abolished. It's very interesting that the Samson work originally showed that the bacteria were doing something important, but they, they wouldn't say what it was. It took them two or three years to publish their next paper showing that it was the curly protein. And Masmanian, his lab is working on development of products targeting the bacteria in the gut, which will not enter the brain, but influence brain diseases through these mechanisms that we're discussing. More recently, Wang in Hong Kong showed that curly co-localizes with alpha-synuclein, shown by the red dot. This is in nematodes. And that on the right, curly promotes neurodegeneration in these nematodes. This ex explains perhaps how it goes from the brain, I'm sorry, from the 
gut to the brain via the gut brain axis, which is bidirectional. So the curly is influencing the alpha synuclein and influencing its conformation. I had proposed at that time that these mechanisms could be involved in all proteinopathies of neurodegeneration, which would include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, frontal temporal lobe degeneration, previously called Hicks disease, ALS, motor neuron disease, Lewy body disease, cortical basal degeneration, multiple system atrophy, and progressive supranuclear palsy. For example, progressive supranuclear palsy is a tau disease. Multiple system atrophy is an amyloid beta protein disease. And these are uh, uh, multiple system atrophies is a synucleinopathy. And these conditions all have no known cause in the non-genetic cases. And in concern with my interest about concepts and uh, critical thinking, it's, it's only my proposal that, or what my way of viewing these things, I like to look at commonalities. All of these conditions have uh, slow progress. Of course, some are faster than others, but they're all relatively slow. They're all neuro neurodegenerations. They're all associated with astrogliosis and microgliosis in the brain. And uh, Stanley Prusner is working very hard to find a treatment for multiple system atrophy, but he's not uh, been successful so far. They're all associated with deficits in metabolism and excessive inflammation. And what I see is a very exciting opportunity in this field is that if we could figure out an effective therapy for one of these conditions, it might turn out to be valuable in others at the same time. Of course, with modification, but the similarity in pathogenesis of these diseases are all quite remarkable. Uh, furthermore, we published this review uh, in 2020 about interaction of the microbiota in stroke. And there are many things about the gut bacteria that can influence stroke. Clots have been shown to contain bacteria and the bacteria that are found in clots in cerebral vessels tend to be those associated with the mouth. Furthermore, uh, saccular aneurysms in the brain have been shown to contain bacteria. Also, sometimes bacteria found normally in the mouth. The pathogenic relationship of these bacteria to the stroke or to the aneurysms is not uh, documented because it could be that the bacteria are just transiently present, such as after a dental procedure or uh, vigorous mouthwashing. But it is enough to consider uh, a role that they might play. And it is already known that periodontitis, which is the most common bacterial infection in the mouth, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and heart disease. So I don't understand this myself. Again, talking about concepts and ideas. Why is oral health not stressed in stroke patients? And it could be I'm just not informed about what happens in the office with patients with stroke. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not there. But from discussions I've had with various people, I'm told that it's not commonly discussed. But it is something, it has absolutely no risk 
and no cost. So I myself discuss oral health with every patient, regardless of what's the matter with them. Of course, sometimes they don't have any teeth and then that's a bit too late to tell them to take care of their mouth. But the truth is that taking care of your teeth is good for the brain. It's also good for your teeth, but everybody knows that, I hope. But they don't know that it's good for the brain. So that this is something we need to be uh, expressing to our patients. Even though they don't come here, they don't come to see us with a question like, uh, you know, Dr. Friedland, should I, should I brush my teeth or not? They don't, that's not uh, why they're coming. Similarly, herpes zoster is a horrible disease called shingles, which we can prevent, or at least the risk can be diminished more than half with a vaccine. And our patients don't come to see us with a question, uh, Dr. Friedland, what can I do to avoid getting shingles? But it's something that everyone over 50, except rare patients who have some heart, severe immune deficiency, they should all be vaccinated. And we should be mentioning this to all our patients, regardless of what, why they are coming to see us. More recently, we are uh, with Zimbal Kurulawala, who is now with the M. Michael J. Fox Foundation. We've been studying uh, the effect of E. coli producing curly on ALS model SOD1 mice. This is the G93A mouse model, uh, together with Levi, Beverly, Leah Siskind, and colleagues in their laboratory. This work was done very laboriously, laboriously, laboriously in these mice by feeding them for seven months, three times a day by hand, uh, cookies based on uh, peanut butter and we studied the influence of exposure to these bacterial amyloid in the ALS phenotype. And the animals were studied with a computerized mouse treadmill. So the way the mouse walked, walked or ran was recorded by a camera on the, below the platform on which the mouse ran. We showed that when they were exposed to bacterial amyloid in the food, compared to those mice exposed to the same uh, bacteria, but without the bacterial amyloid. So the control group had a mutant bacteria that could not produce the curly protein. Those animals exposed to bacterial amyloid had relatively impaired locomotion, atrophy of skeletal muscle, astrogliosis, increased serum markers of inflammation and demyelination of lymphocytes in the spinal cord. These are all features of ALS in these animals. This is shown here. The red lines are those curly exposed animals, or maybe it's pink. And on the left, it's shown that their stride is longer, particularly at six months. And on the right, it showed that their gait is wider when exposed to curly. This is kind of, uh, uh, I find this hilarious that what do we do with patients when we ask them to walk? And the main thing we're looking at, we're looking at aside from arm swing, of course, and many things, but we look at arm swing, but we look at the wide, if they have a wide base gait, and what we showed here on the right is that these transgenic Alzheimer model mice, if they're fed curly compared to mice fed the mutant bacteria that don't make curly, they had a wide base gait. This is not something you could get out of looking at these animals. 
And we are grateful to the spinal cord injury research group who has uh, did this very complex and detailed and valuable analysis. Uh, more recently, during my sabbatical year at the Kyoto University, uh, Kyoto Prefectural University of Medicine and Kyoto Institute of Technology, we studied these things in Drosophila. And the Drosophila have been used in six Nobel Prizes. It's hard to uh, get a picture of the enormity of Drosophila research. The benefit is the fruit flies have a life cycle of only one month. And an experiment in, in fruit flies might last two to three months. A similar project in mice might last one and a half to two years. And of course, in humans, it would most likely be impossible. But the genetics of Drosophila are extremely easy to manipulate, relatively easy. To manipulate. So whatever you want to do with the genes, you can buy a fly which has a model of any known genetic disease, perhaps. And you can get a thousand animals with the gene in a few days or, or maybe a week. And the, the re research with the flies involves moving them from tube to tube and collecting the virgin females and making uh, new babies and mixing one genotype with another. Also, of course, the food that they have is completely under our control. And uh, they don't have a very complex microbiota, of course, but it is known what organisms they have. And they do have a uh, epithelium in their gut and nutrient interactions has been widely demonstrated. We published this paper about how this can be a model system, but our work was uh, rather laborious when we found the right food for these particular mice. This slide shows in these uh, Q331K ALS model, transgenic Drosophila, that exposure to the curly did not influence climbing on the left. In uh, depending on exposure to curly. And uh, this was disappointing that we did not find evidence of what we had anticipated. But this work is continuing with different transgenic animals. For, which are models for ALS. So to, to summarize a bit, it's been shown that animals that have a gene for Alzheimer's disease, the presenilin-1 APP gene, have reduced amyloid pathology. So these are germ-free mice who have no bacteria. And when I say bacteria, I mean also um, viruses and other parasites and other microbes. So why would the Alzheimer's disease phenotype in mice be helped by the absence of the bacteria? The Masmanian group suggests that the difference is the curly that's produced by the bacteria. This was shown by Harach and Dodia and colleagues shown that there's a sex-specific effect. We found a sex-specific effect in ALS model mice if it was worse in males and females, but that the microglia were important contributors to the amyloidosis in these animals. And that uh, this is quite remarkable now that it's shown by Marco Prince from Freiburg and others that the morphology and activity of microglia in the brain 
is influenced by gut bacteria. And the microglia are involved in just about everything the brain does. So I thought the microglia are scavengers, like uh, phagocytes in the blood, so that if you have an infection in the brain or a brain injury, the microglia will clean up the debris or eat up the viruses, eat up the bacteria. And this is probably true. However, recent work shows the microglia actually participate in synapse formation and destruction. So learning involves making new synapses and destroying other synapses that are not needed. So perhaps forgetting involves destruction of neuronal connections and learning involves creating new neuronal connections and that the microglia are involved in that. And then this new work shows that what we eat, which influences the gut bacteria, could be operating through effects on microglia, which, and this is uh, significant in regard to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, but also for autism spectrum disorder. And the Masmanian lab is devoted to getting new treatments based on the microglia for both Parkinson's and autism. There is a clinical trial underway for fecal microbiota transplant in ALS in Italy. And uh, in this Cry in Masmanian review article in Science last year, they pointed out that there's already evidence that fecal microbiota transplant in humans is safe and it can be done. And that uh, this involves taking microbial bacteria or microbial samples, which is basically feces and administering them to uh, humans from one person to another. And this has already been shown to be very effective for uh, Clostridium difficile, which I think has a new name, uh, Clostridioides. But uh, the morbidity of this GI disease was very high and it was difficult to treat with antibiotics. But with fecal microbiota transplant, it was shown that the bacterial populations can be changed and uh, the mor mortality of the disease is, has declined quite significantly. In addition, there are many uh, studies shown here and more recent ones showing that the idea we originally proposed in 2015 that bacterial amyloid could cause templated misfolding of neuronal proteins is true for alpha-synuclein and amyloid beta, as well as serum amyloid A. You may remember a favorite slide of mine years ago that feeding pate de foie gras to mice caused accelerated amyloid formation for serum amyloid A, so that the uh, amyloid found in food can interact with amyloid formation in the body. We have a number of new collaborations, particularly with uh, Harry Bartolori and colleagues in microbiology and immunology, looking at the effect of human microbiota on markers of Alzheimer's disease in transgenic germ-free Alzheimer model mice. These mice, which contain several mutations for human Alzheimer's disease, uh, will be raised in germ-free facilities in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And this is funded by a grant from the Department of Defense. And we are collecting bacteria or uh, we're collecting stool from human Alzheimer's subjects, and it will be transplanted into these mice to look at what the interactions are with the disease development in these animals. 
also with Levi Beverly and colleagues in the Brown Cancer Center and Department of Medicine. We're looking at, we will be looking at copper complexes that interact with copper deficient SOD1. So superoxide dismutase is the first and one of the most important ALS genes. And it has a copper association and how the copper complexes may interact with this will be studied in this new project. In conclusion, the microbiota have been with us for many years and they evolved with us and we evolved with them. This is not a recent development and they influence the brain and the brain influences the bacteria. So it has been said that the bacteria are gardened by the immune system. The brain and the body has some awareness of what bacteria are present and has influences the interactions of the bacteria in a bi-directional matter. Most of our genes are microbial, so we can change these genes through gene therapy in the kitchen, particularly in a desirable manner by eating less meat and more fiber, because meat has no fiber, and fiber epigenetically enhances the production of regulatory lymphocytes in the blood, which are actively anti-inflammatory and tolerance inducing. And inflammation has a component, is important in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, heart disease and stroke and cancer and other things that, but uh, the influence is quite extensive. And it, it is reasonable to tell people that they don't have to eat meat in order to have protein. Because you can get protein from plants and from cheese and soybeans and so on, and um, eggs. But a African buffalo may weigh 2,000 pounds and it eats only plants. Nobody would say it suffers from a protein deficiency because it doesn't eat meat. And in my, uh, in my book on aging, I describe in detail how the microbiota interactions can be adjusted through diet. And I would be grateful if you can provide me with suggestions about other aspects of critical thinking, which could uh, be important for teaching. And since since it appears that I have more time, I'd like to discuss one aspect of this involving spinal cord injury. It's my understanding that at U of L and also at other distinguished spinal cord injury research programs, the spinal cord injury is produced by dropping a weight on the naked spinal cord. That is the investigator uh, anesthetizes the animal lying on it on its stomach and opens the cord by removing the lamina, thus doing a laminectomy and dropping a weight on the uh, naked cord. This creates an injury which, is, which never happens in humans. And it's my idea in considering animal models that a basic concept would be the animal model should be as close to the human situation as possible if we are to learn about the human situation. And uh, I came up with this objection to the use of a model involving the naked cord a few years ago, not exactly understanding why that would make a difference. It just seemed to me a reasonable proposal that it would be more appropriate to drop the weight on the back and create the injury in a similar manner to the way it's done in humans. Now, I'm not proposing here that we get the mice to ride a motorcycle or to wear a bandana around their head, uh, but just that it 
is possible to have a more similar model by uh, dropping the weight on the cord before the lamina are removed without removing the lamina. And only in the past six months have I learned that there is bone marrow in the skull. That shouldn't be surprising, but it's not something I ever thought about before. And I discussed this with a hematologist and he agrees there is probably bone marrow in the spine, in the bones in the spine, in the lamina, in the dorsal processes and in the vertebral bodies. And that means in a, in a real, in a spinal cord injury that affects a human, there is, a, not only is there the trauma part, which of course is, is horrible and pathogenic and extreme, but the site of the wound is contaminated with dirt from the skin and the road, perhaps, and the clothing, and the immune cells in the bones are going to be interacting with the spinal cord and perhaps influencing repair. And um, we know that there's an inflammatory component for recovery from spinal cord injury, just as there's an inflammatory component for pr probably everything then, uh, for all pathologies. But that this is my uh, conceptualization of why it would be more appropriate to look at a spinal cord injury with um, a model which more closely resembles the human situation. Finally, another aspect of this in considering how animal models are chosen is, in my opinion, the animal model needs to be chosen in regard to the human disease because what we're really interested in is the human disease. But there are those I have spoken to who thinks, think that they do not need to be concerned primarily with the human disease. They're perfectly happy to study it in regard to animals without considering uh, in detail what it means for humans. And in that regard, I point out that the funding usually comes from the NIH and not the NIMB. The NIH, of course, is the National Institute of Health, and it's not the National Institute of Mouse Biology. And uh, I'd be very grateful to have your questions, and thank you for your attention. And I look forward to the future when we can have meetings in public and look, look at each other and um, have human interactions, not requiring uh, technology. So Dr. Freeland, thank you for your, your uh, talk this morning. And um, if you could unshare the screen to kind of open up the, the dialogue a little bit to others. The, um, just to expand upon the comment that you made, so, you know, as we study uh, medicine, we have various mentors and various people that can, we can refer to that kind of influenced our lives. Um, uh, when I was in training in St. Louis, uh, uh, Raymond Adams uh, came and gave a lecture and then specifically wanted to meet with the residents. And um, one of his comments, and this is, you know, 30 years ago, <laughs> was, if you're doing research somewhere uh, in a laboratory and you can't apply that or reason how that is going to help a human being, then you probably shouldn't be doing that research. And I've always kind of remembered that. And so uh, I admire your work because you always are uh, discussing the, not just as some distant analogy or metaphor, but you're actually applying it in a bench to bedside manner, you know this is this is how change can be made in in uh, one's lifestyle and how this might influence the risk of development of very serious neurodegenerative diseases. So, uh, really appreciate uh, this this work. I wanted to ask. This is a, a maybe an esoteric question, but 
um, the green tea that you buy out of like uh, vending machines, um, you know, it's now, I, I think Coca-Cola and maybe some others have, have this green tea that, you know, we want to make good choices in our life in terms of our diet. And um, at times I've, I've got, gotten the green tea. Um, it, do you have any idea? Is this you know, good quality green tea or is this just like some something that was put in a soda bottle? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm only familiar with the green tea they sell in, in Japan, which it, it doesn't have any flavoring, coloring, preservatives. And it's, it's very good. You can even buy in Japan one which is a very high density or high concentrated. It's quite bitter, but it's it's a it's a uh, you can get used to it. But green tea has anti-amyloid properties, but it's also antioxidant, and uh, it may have effects against cancer. So there is a long list of things that green tea may be good for, and I I recommend drinking maybe at least two cups a day, which is hard to do, but uh, um, I think I think it's a good suggestion. In regard to your, your point about um, why people do research, uh, I did have a boss, a lab chief at NIA, who frustrated me because he told me that he didn't care if his research was trivial. He only wanted to know if he could publish it. And this guy was spending $5 million a year of our money in his laboratory. Uh, but in, in another sense, we're really in trouble because a lot of new journals and the existing journals have changed their criteria. So scientific reports, uh, which I used to be on the editorial board, they specifically say their work they publish does not have to be significant. And we're not, the reviewers are not allowed to consider significance in deciding whether a paper should be published or not. And why did they do this? Well, you know, it's theoretically possible something that you think is not significant is really important in the future. So this is how science advances. It's true that basic science is good, even if it has no reflection on human conditions, that that's true. However, they publish 20,000 papers a year scientific reports, this is a nature journal, and it has an impact factor of about five, which is not too bad, but they publish all these insignificant papers. The reason is that they're making an enormous amount of money. So this problem with insignificant research being flooding the uh, press in part is because of money, and I don't know uh, what we can do about it. Yeah, it's, it's become kind of increasingly hard, I think, uh, particularly for young scientists to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of the quality of the journal as well, uh, because there are a lot of uh, shell journals that are created. Um, I, I'm sure your email is flooded, just like mine is with, uh, you know, the journal of blah, blah, blah that you've never heard of, and you're trying to sort of figure out whether that's you know, something worth considering as a new startup or whether that's because it's relatively, you know, kind of inexpensive to create something in cyberspace. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. The, the Green Journal of Neurology used to be published once a month. <laughs> and I think now that it's published every week, its quality has gone down considerably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my reading queue is is something that uh, I just became aware of that I don't know if it was actually published in the last week. I received it on a um, list serve, so but it's in my queue to read that that you published on I believe I believe it was in Frontiers in Neuroscience on the uh, gut brain axis. It was more of a review type paper. Um, yes, in, in COVID. Uh, well, this one was just um, just in the last week or two. Uh, yes. It, yeah. Yes, that's right. That um, the the idea was I wanted to move the field away from considering all these antibodies, so that there's enormous. The press is very interested, of course, in Alzheimer treatment, 
and our patients are interested in that as well. But I think that the, the potential for the microbial approach is better than the potential for the amyloid immunotherapy. But the amyloid, am, amyloid immunotherapy is taking all the air in the room or taking all the air out of the room. And uh, the, elephant is gonna, the elephant in the room is gonna drop dead if it doesn't have enough oxygen. Right? So that the, uh, the elephant in the room is that the bacterial component is very promising for therapy. And that, uh, uh, as I said, there may be therapies which can be applied to all these diseases all at once. Yes. Um, I know there's always there's there's been for years a, a public health concern about sort of over prescribing of antibiotics and its influence on the gut microbiota. Uh, do you think that that uh, it plays a role in maybe some of the uh, you know, changes in the prevalence of some of these uh, conditions? Yes, certainly. It's, it's believed that the increase in allergies and uh, asthma, and I forgot the, some skin condition, is associated with excessive cleanliness in childhood. Uh, Jack Gilbert, a microbiology, microbiologist, in this area has written, co-authored a book entitled Dirt is Good. And they, they say that growing up with a dog is good for the immune system of children and that excessive antibiotic use is probably not, not a good idea. And of course, I didn't know this when my son was a boy, he, now he's 45, but when he was little, he'd be getting antibiotics all the time whether it's probably not, not the, uh, the best thing. Yeah, it's, um, you know, that's a, a kind of a, a whole separate issue, but it's kind of over prescribing of antibiotics for, you know, conditions that are felt to be viral and therefore not responsive to antibiotics is a whole, whole thing. The other, I guess, aspect of things is uh, the use in agriculture of antibiotics for, uh, you know, chickens and other farm animals. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mike. That that's right. So one 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 thing about diet which I haven't mentioned is uh, there's no need to get antibiotics on food. You know, if, if you, and you should take antibiotics only when it's absolutely necessary, and never from food. The only reason it's used in food is it helps the producer to make the producer of the food to make more money right. is helping anything else. Yeah. So instead of being um, suitable for slaughter at eight weeks, it, the animal can like be sufficiently plump at six weeks, for example, maybe for chickens, although I don't know the, the really number, the real number of weeks, but it, 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 there's no reason for human health other than money that uh, antibiotics are used in animals. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, life exists as a balance, and so it is uh, can be fragile, and it can be the balance can be tipped in in one direction or another, and result in uh, massive and catastrophic uh, events, including disease states. Right, and if there's anyone in the audience from neurosurgery, I would love to know what they think about my comments about spinal cord injury. It's Alex Avechkin from Spinal Cord Injury Group, but Alex. from the from the um, the clinical side, um, rehab side. Yeah, you're right. So the um, many elements that we have in real life cannot right now mimicking in animal model and all of these components. You know, bone fracture and. Uh, damaging spine, uh, spinal cord with those sharp edges, inflammation and bone uh, marrow, what you just mentioned, all of these elements should be accounted for the real model of spinal cord injury, you're right. Thank you. Thank you.
the best line about animal models is uh, from some fellow named George Box. He said, all models are wrong. Some are useful. So we should never assume that any model could be perfect, but at least some are better than others. Some models are better, more appropriate, more similar than others. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> basically no uh, studies from animal model in the spinal cord injury came to the to the practice, basically. That tells something about it. What is that again? Could you so say that? None of the uh, results from spinal cord injury research came from animal model were, were successfully uh, transferred to the clinical practice yet. That tells about your point. Right, thank you. Yes, so, so my idea was that I, I thought in the 70s that steroid use, high dose steroids were recommended for spinal cord injury. And I, I assumed that idea came from mice, but it turned out in humans, it's not effective. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And many others. Right, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but um, uh, mice are not little men in white fur suits. Yeah, agree. Thank you for the talk, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Was that Martin? Okay, thank you everybody for your attention. Thank, thank you, Dr. Fink. Thank you, Lilia. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike.